Bob, so Peter Wiedinski and myself, my name is Sven Wassmann, cardiologist from, from Munich. We will talk about anticoagulants and anti-platelet uh, treatment in stroke. So I will, cover, I will cover primary and secondary prevention and uh, Peter will talk about the acute phase. So we want this to be interactive, so that's why we will show cases and, and ask you to discuss with us. So I start with this case. It's a lady, 73 year old, diagnosed with Parkinson's atrial fibrillation, now in sinus rhythm. She was started for whatever reason on aspirin, just mild carotid disease. Kidney function is, is okay. Chats vas score of two, and in my presentations I still use the has blood score. So you find it has blood score of two because of her age and aspirin co-medication. So my first question for you is who would initiate or Anticoagulation for this patient now. Sorry. So, some hands go up. Okay. All right. Very good. What you do with aspirin? Okay. We stop aspirin. Of course, we do. Brings down has blood score to one. Obviously, she has no indication for aspirin anyway. But if we stop that medication, her has blood score will come down because there's no co medication. Okay. Now, the same patient in this scenario. Now, this lady has arterial hypertension. And she has a blood pressure of 165 over 90. The rest is identical. Has the blood score is 3. So, no, first question, who would start anticoagulation in this patient? Chats Vask of 3. Okay, very good. What do we do with this? Treat it, obviously. So, the reason for her having a has blood score of 3 is because arterial hypertension is not controlled. So, if we control hypertension, it's not a risk factor anymore for bleeding risk which would bring down her has blood score to two. And then we have the same question with aspirin. It's the same. So if we stop anticoagulation, we stop aspirin. So her has blood score is one. Okay, so the guidelines taken from the ESC, uh, the ESC guidelines from 2016, this is taken from the guidelines, sorry. So we still have the chats vas score. We still have this with a chats vas score of zero, no indication for any antithrombotic treatment, not aspirin not oral anticoagulation, score of one, oral anticoagulation should be considered and a score score of two or more is a recommendation to initiate oral anticoagulation. So now we have the lady, if you think of the first case, she has a chats vas score of two. So if you just take this slide, it's an indication, but there's a differentiation made in the new guidelines and that's my teaching point here, which is shown here because female risk is, a, is a, not a good risk predictor in the low risk cohort. It was kind of taken out of the equation. So the score is still the same, the chats VASC, but the indication for oral, indication for oral anticoagulation is different in males and females. So if you have a male patient with a chats VASC score of 2, oral anticoagulation, is, oral anticoagulation is indicated. If you have a female, you should have a score of 3, which means we take out the female sex, so that's a difference. So in the first case, without arterial hypertension, it's a we can in, uh, anticoagulate decision, whereas in the second scenario with a score of three, there's a clear indication to initiate oral anticoagulation. Okay, but now again, why would you start oral anticoagulation in this lady with a chats vask of two, which is chats vask of one in, in males? So the guidelines you say that if you have a chance to one, you may institute yes. a yes. you may consider yes. it, or you should consider it. And I think she has quite a good reason for that because it was shown that age is a good is a good predictor. So she's kind of reaching the 75 goal, and that's why I would start initiating. I would initiate oral anticoagulation as well. Age is, is a very good risk. Did, didn't you show the kidney function as well? I said yeah, kidney function, creatinine clearance was 65. So, yeah, a short question that, uh, regarding the Chats Vasco in this uh, particular case. She has also carotid plaques, and this wouldn't she get caught also from vascular disease? That's a very good question. It's not in the Chats Vasco score. That's, uh, no, it's, it's aortic plaques, it's a prior uh, MI, and it's peripheral disease. I personally do it if there's carotid stenosis. I do it if there's coronary artery disease, mild plaques. I just use this as an example because in my country, people do still initiate people on aspirin treatment just for plaques. You know, there's no, no significant carotid disease. I would not count that in. It's not in the score and it's not significant. I mean, I, I know what you mean. You could count it at vascular disease. 
There's no clear definition for that. The definition in the score is just aortic plaques, it's prior MI, and it's peripheral disease, so not even coronary disease. What I'd call coronary disease with a stent or vascular manifestation, but uh, no, I think not plaques, just insignificant plaques. I don't know how you manage that. But anyway, I, I agree I would initiate, but my point here is that we can initiate in the first scenario, whereas we should in the second scenario. Okay, so what should we use? The guidelines um, recommend NOAC over warfarin or vitamin K antagonist treatment because of the trial data that we have. I don't want to go much into detail just to show you that NOACs have uh, equal or have better results in terms of stroke prevention and bleeding risk. So that's, why the, that's the reason for the uh, um, recommendation and we have a much lower risk for intracranial hemorrhages with NOAC versus warfarin. All right, so now the patient progresses. Now we enter the secondary prevention phase. So now this lady had a mild ischemic stroke two weeks ago, and I will not talk about the timing of restarting. Peter will do this, but that's clearly not a problem here. Uh, so she had a scenario, she had an ESA scenario, so no, no reason was found. She was on sinus rhythm, uh, so she, because she has coronary disease, she was on aspirin and this was just left. So she was on aspirin after her stroke. Arterial hypertension well controlled. The same, is, this is identical. Kidney function is okay. But now she came for a follow-up visit to cardiology. The Holter ECG was done and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation was found. So now we have a patient in the secondary prevention scenario. Primary ESIS, now atrial fibrillation diagnosed. Her chest vascular is six. Her husband's score is three because of age, aspirin, and previous stroke. So what is the, what would you do? Anticoagulate the patient, okay. NOAC or warfarin? NOAC, okay. What about aspirin, coronary disease? Stop it, stop it. absolutely. Absolutely, she's completely stable, so stop it, and again brings down her blood score quite dramatically. I agree. Okay, so that's, that's the clear thing, yeah. Some straightforward electrophysiologists may suggest that they like, follow oh, anyway. <laughs> You could, but the current recommendations are still indication for all anticoagulation because of her risk score. Uh, you know that there are trials ongoing, but there's a different risk score, I have to say, to check whether ablation really brings down the risk of stroke. But at the current stage, you could ablate her, obviously, but uh, this would not take away the, the indication for anticoagulation. Okay. So just to show you that we do have data to recommend NOAC treatment in patients uh, with previous stroke. Uh, those were well recommended and uh, uh, represented in the phase three trials. Just one example, the Apixaban trial, there was no significant interaction between patients with or without previous stroke. And if you look at this, patients with previous stroke had a higher risk of another stroke and the absolute risk reduction was higher. Uh, so I think uh, we have good data to recommend NOAC in these patients with previous stroke. Any question for that? Because I will switch to something, to something more cardiological now. <laughs> I, think that's a, I think that's a clear thing. Okay, now, three months later, eight paroxysmal AFib, sinus rhythm, now she has an acute coronary syndrome. And STEMI constellation gets stented with a drug-eluting stent. She was put on the bigger tran 150, now this is what we have. We have a lady with a stroke three months ago, <coughs> acute coronary event, on to bigger trend 150. So, what do we do now? So, you are by the change to warfarin. Okay, so you, you would add what antitoxin? Both. So aspirin and clopidogrel, and switch to warfarin. Okay, so that's... It depends on... I probably set uh, aspirin for one month, and clopidogrel for the next year. Okay, very good. So you suggest classic triple therapy for four months and then, then switch to dual. Sorry, for one month and then switch to, to dual treatment. Okay, very good. Any other suggestions? Ablate. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, you wouldn't because it's paroxysmal and it could be in the center. So she's trying to get in here. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's just, just because of the comment before. No, no, ablation has nothing to do with it. Okay, so we have one suggestion is triple therapy for four weeks and then dual treatment. Very good. According to the, uh, to the new assignments in double uh, implanted therapy, we need to weigh the risk of bleeding and the right. skin uh, right. events, right? right? So uh, if the um, 
if the risk of ischemia is greater, which in the case of acute coronary syndrome, you probably would fall into this category, uh, we should extend the triple therapy for as long as we could, maximum to six months. Okay. And I will need from a little bit run to reduce the dose to okay. um, 110. To 110. So you say triple therapy six months, reduce the dose of, of the bigger trend. Very good. What else? She has a high bleeding risk, has blood is three. There's one other scenario that you could do. Well, there's still Sorry? Two drugs, right? Exactly. You, you, could, you could actually put her on, on dual therapy from the start, leave the bigger trend at 150, or you could reduce it to 110 and give one antiplatelet, which is clopidogrel. And why is that? Just to show you this, that two trials, the Pioneer AF trial with, with uh, Rivaroxaban and the Redual trial with Dabigatran, which tested dual versus triple therapy. And just to make it short, bleeding risk was quite, quite dramatically reduced with uh, both dosages of Dabigatran. Also, major bleeding was, was reduced. And we have to be careful because these trials were not powered for ischemic safety. That's not possible. You need 20, 30,000 patients for that. But at least there was no signal for harm not in the Rivaroxaban trial, not in the NOAC, uh, in the Dabigatran trial. So this could be another option. And i just show you, that's my last slide, the current recommendations of the ESC regarding dual antiplatelet therapy in CAD. And this is for patients with atrial fib and PCI. And it's exactly what you said. So there is a differentiation between the risk of bleeding and ischemia. So we, can, we have patients with high ischemic risk, which is coronary risk, it's not stroke risk. Um, or intermediate risk or high bleeding risk. And this recommendation gives us the chance to do whatever we want now. So we could go with classic triple therapy for six months because she has an ACS. That's one possibility. Or exactly like you suggested, we, should, we could go with triple therapy for four weeks and then switch to dual therapy or start with dual therapy right from the start. So these recommendations took into account the Rivaroxaban trial, not the Dabigatran trial. So this will change again, I guess. Um, but we could do anything here. I have to say that 50% of patients in uh, the Pioneer trial and the Redual trial were patients with ACS. So those were actually represented. So I think that's quite difficult. I, I'm not sure what I would do in this patient with um, with a Hasblatt score of three. Um, I think I'd go with this treatment. She is on Dabigatran. We have a good trial data here. And I think I'd leave her on, I don't know, 150 with clopidogrel or go to 110 with clopidogrel. I think the data are quite good. But I'd just show you this because we can do anything and it's a very individualized decision making, which is always between the neurologist and the cardiologist. OK, any other question? Okay, then we switch to, to Peter's presentation. Yes, please. Uh, maybe we can, I personally will take count about the uh, angio. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, a main stand, it's approximately right, right. Yes. Uh, this uh, diffuse disease, <coughs> and it's probably a yeah. continual triple yes. for longer. Yes, I agree with you. So that's basically, that accounts for ischemic risk. So is it ACS that's higher ischemic risk? You'd rather go maybe with triple therapy or longer, or it's like, let's say, uh, extensive stenting, it's bifurcation stenting, then you'd rather go with longer treatment. I agree with you. I think in this patient, uh, I made it easy, that's like mid-LAD stent, very uncomplicated. I think I personally would go with, let's say, the redual design and leave her on the bigger trend and put clopidogrel to it. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, I will share with you some, some cases and uh, I invite you to uh, comment directly on what you see or what you hear. Uh, I will start with case three because uh, in the previous room we discussed case one and case two uh, and then we had no time for, uh, for case three. So I start with case three and if we have time I come back to case <laughs> one and two. Uh, so this is um, an 83 years old male who came in with a severe stroke with NHS score 20 uh, five hours after symptom onset. So quite long delay in an elderly gentleman. And you see here his angiography with uh, proximal occlusion of internal carotid artery. Uh, after it was uh, opened by the guide wire and by stent, you can see that there was second occlusion distally. So this is a classical tandem lesion. And uh, then thrombectomy was done and uh, everything was reperfused. So uh, the angiographic success was uh, 
did this three, so it was uh, very good. And surprisingly, despite the, um, despite the five hours delay, the clinical outcome was also rather good. Uh, the antithrombotic medication, which is the topic of this workshop, pre-procedural, nothing, so in the emergency ambulance, uh, he did not receive any treatment. Periprocedure, we gave Kardegic, what is intravenous uh, salicylate, and a very low dose of heparin, uh, just 25 units per kilo. And uh, because it was five hours after onset, he did not receive thrombolysis. And uh, during first 12 hours until control CT, he was treated only by clopidogrel because of stent implantation, but not with dual uh, treatment. So he, we did not use ASA before we have seen the control CT. At control CT scan, there was only small ischemia. And clinically, as I said, he was re recovering very well. And he had carotid stent implanted in the acute phase. So then we decided after control CT to add aspirin. So he was, at the end of day one, he was put on dual antiplated therapy. And my question to you is, what do you think is the optimal antithrombotic strategy in carotid stenting during acute stroke? So here you have several options. Uh, if the patient uh, gets acute stent uh, in the acute phase of stroke, you can start immediately dual antiplatelet therapy, or you can start as we did uh, only one of the antiplatelet agents and add the second one after you see on CT that there is no intracranial hemorrhage. A uh, few hours, or 12 or 24 hours after, uh, after onset. Or you can withdraw, with, withheld the antithrombotic medication un after the CT, so you can uncover the first 12 hours and start it only after the CT. So what will be your suggestion? Who will start immediately after the procedure with dual antiplatelet therapy? Nobody? Oh, three, four? Yeah. Who will start with single antiplatelet therapy? Doesn't matter which one. Two, three, four, the same. <laughs> And who will not give anything and wait until CT scan? Because this was long delay, so five hours of delay. So there is quite substantial risk that there will be hemorrhagic transformation because long ischemia and reperfusion. So who will wait with antiplatelet therapy after CT? Nobody. Okay, <laughs> thanks. And the second question which comes out from this case is, because this is controversial, and especially this is controversial if the patient received thrombolysis before. This one did not. But if the patient is treated with thrombolysis and receives stent acutely in the, during the intervention, then it's a very difficult decision to give dual antiplatelet therapy immediately after thrombolysis. The risk of hemorrhagic transformation is then very high. So then the question is technical, whether we should implant stent in the acute phase of of a thrombectomy, if there is a carotid occlusion, of course, or critical stenosis, or whether we should just dilate the carotid with balloon and postpone the stent implantation a few days later, when we are sure that there is no hemorrhage and when we, are, when we can, uh, can uh, make so-called so deferred stenting. So who would suggest to, st to implant stent in the acute phase? about six, and who would suggest to postpone to defer stenting a few days later when, uh, bleeding, is, uh, when bleeding is excluded? Nobody. <laughs> this is an open question. There are no data on this and both options. Interestingly, uh, a year ago, or maybe half, one and a half year ago, there was a special issue of journal Coret Vaza uh, published uh, about stroke. The whole issue was about stroke. And I did there a survey among 10 recognized colleagues worldwide from Europe, from US, who are treating acute strokes. And I asked them to say whether they would implant stent in the acute phase or not, whether they would defer stenting. And the, the experience was really <laughs> very broadly, <laughs> very broadly um, uh, divided. So there is no clear uh, decision and we have to wait for some studies to decide on this. So I think we have still a few minutes, so I can go, to, we have three, four minutes, so I can go to case one or case two, I think. Case two was probably more, more uh, interesting because of uh, many discussions we had. 
So case two is, is a 78-years-old uh, female uh, with atrial fibrillation. And on atrial fibrillation, she was treated only with ASA, what is, of course, against the guidelines, but this was the case. So she came in with aspirin treatment for atrial fibrillation and a big stroke with NIHS score 22. And she came in four hours after symptom onset. She received thrombolysis 45 minutes before angiography and angiography was done. So the thrombectomy, as you see on the picture, this was occlusion of terminal carotid artery when the branching is to middle and uh, anterior cerebral artery. And this is after, uh, after a successful thrombectomy. So angiographically, this was successful, but the clot was removed approximately five hours after stroke onset. So the stroke was running quite long. So there is again the problem as the previous case, relatively late reperfusion with higher risk of, of hemorrhagic transformation. So what about antithrombotic medication? Uh, she, she received uh, thrombolysis, as I said. This was the dose for, for her body weight. No other periprocedural treatment, so no heparin periprocedural because thrombolysis was still ongoing at the beginning of procedure. And during first 18 hours, no other antithrombotic medications until we made control CT and we have seen uh, the CT uh, without a significant hemorrhage. And there was uh, no minimal clinical recovery, so this was not so great success as the previous uh, gentleman. Uh, and this was obviously because uh, she was treated five hours after the onset and she was elderly. And uh, there was, of course, as I mentioned, atrial fibrillation. So we decided to give no antithrombotics for the next three days, so including with the day one, four days without antithrombotics, and then rivaroxaban started on day five. So the question here is when to restart or when to start oral anticoagulation in large stroke with atrial fibrillation. Who would start oral anticoagulants uh, earlier than we did? So any time during the first five days. CT, CT, CT did not show, here it is, no intracranial hemorrhage on CT. Yeah. So who would start anticoagulation during the first five days in this lady with severe stroke and successful trauma? One, two. Who would start later? More of you. <laughs> yeah. The guidelines say that uh, in these cases with large stroke, you should start uh, between day 6 and 12, somewhere you can find between day 6 and 14. And in general, the guidelines say that in strokes, you should start between day 1 and day 14, depending on the size of stroke and, of course, on the results of the imaging. But uh, what, uh, what is also uh, here to discuss is uh, the low molecular weight heparin. Uh, who of you is using or would recommend to use routinely low molecular weight heparin for deep venous thrombosis prevention in stroke? Nobody? So you are not using it for DVT prevention in stroke patients? It's a surprise. <laughs> Wolfram, you are not using it in Berlin? No, the intervention. I mean, uh, low molecular heparin as prevention of deep venous thrombosis in acute stroke patients. Uh, sure. You are using it in low doses. Yeah. Uh, the, for, for me, it is unclear whether this, is, this should be the case for patients with successful thrombectomy. Because with successful, like, like in this case, with successful thrombectomy, you have, to, uh, you, you have the situation that you have open artery, so the risk of hemorrhagic transformation is higher than when the artery remains closed. So uh, the risk of uh, heparin is bigger in these cases. Don't you think so? No? I don't know. It's, uh, it's just speculation. There are no data on this. And then we had the question, what do you do in the meantime? So there's a stroke. Oral anticoagulation was started uh, on day five in this case. What do you do in the meantime? This is an AFib patient, so between day zero and day five, would you give aspirin? Would you just wait? So who'd give aspirin in the meantime? Okay. Yeah, this okay. is good. This is per, per guidelines. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.